chapter 78, The Power of Prayer, The Need for Family Prayer. Every family should rear its altar of prayer, realizing that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If any persons in the world need the strength and encouragement that religion gives, it is those who are responsible for the education and training of children. They cannot do their work in a manner acceptable to God while their daily example teaches those who look to them for guidance that they can live without God. If they educate their children to live for this life only, they will make no preparation for eternity. They will die as they have lived without God, and parents will be called to account for the loss of their souls. Fathers, mothers, you need to seek God morning and evening at the family altar that you may learn how to teach your children wisely, tenderly, lovingly. Family worship neglected. If ever there was a time when every house should be a house of prayer, it is now. Infidelity and skepticism prevail. Iniquity abounds. Corruption flows in the vital currents of the soul, and rebellion against God breaks out in the life. Enslaved by sin, the moral powers are under the tyranny of Satan. The soul is made the sport of his temptations, and unless some mighty arm is stretched out to rescue him, man goes where the arch-rebel leads the way. And yet in this time of fearful peril, some who profess to be Christians have no family worship. They do not honor God in the home. They do not teach their children to love and fear Him. Many have separated themselves so far from Him that they feel under condemnation in approaching Him. They cannot come boldly under the throne of grace, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Hebrews 4.16 1 Timothy 2.8 They have not a living connection with God. Theirs is a form of godliness without the power. The idea that prayer is not essential is one of Satan's most successful devices to ruin souls. Prayer is communion with God, the fountain of wisdom, the source of strength, and peace and happiness. Tragedy of a Prayerless Home I know of nothing that causes me so great sadness as a prayerless home. I do not feel safe in such a house for a single night and were it not for the hope of helping the parents to realize their necessity and their sad neglect, I would not remain. The children show the result of this neglect, for the fear of God is not before them. Formal prayer is not acceptable. In many cases, the morning and evening worship is little more than a mere form, a dull, monotonous repetition of set phrases in which the spirit of gratitude or the sense of need finds no expression. The Lord accepts not such service, but the petitions of a humble heart and contrite spirit he will not despise. The opening of our hearts to our Heavenly Father, the acknowledgement of our entire dependence, the expression of our wants, the homage of grateful love, this is true prayer. Let there be households of prayer. Like the patriarchs of old, those who profess to love God should erect an altar to the Lord wherever they pitch their tent. Fathers and mothers should often lift up their hearts to God in humble supplication for themselves and their children. Let the father, as priest of the household, lay upon the altar of God the morning and evening sacrifice while the wife and children unite in prayer and praise. In such a household, Jesus will love to tarry. Let the members of every family bear in mind that they are closely allied to heaven. The Lord has a special interest in the families of his children here below. Angels offer the smoke of the fragrant incense for the praying saints. Then in every family let prayer ascend to heaven both in the morning and at the cool sunset hour in our behalf presenting before God the Savior's merits. Morning and evening, the heavenly universe take notice of every praying household. Angels guard children dedicated to God. Before leaving the house for labor, all the family should be called together, and the father or the mother in the father's absence should plead fervently with God to keep them through the day. Come in humility with a heart full of tenderness and with a sense of the temptations and dangers before yourselves and your children. By faith, bind them upon the altar, entreating for them the care of the Lord. 
ministering angels will guard children who are thus dedicated to God. Prayer makes a hedge about children. In the morning, the Christian's first thoughts should be upon God. Worldly labor and self-interest should be secondary. Children should be taught to respect and reverence the hour of prayer. It is the duty of Christian parents, morning and evening, by earnest prayer and persevering faith, to make a hedge about their children. They should patiently instruct them, kindly and untiringly teach them how to live in order to please God. Have fixed times for worship. In every family there should be a fixed time for morning and evening worship. How appropriate it is for parents to gather their children about them before the fast is broken, to thank the Heavenly Father for His protection during the night, and to ask Him for His help and guidance and watch care during the day. How fitting also when evening comes for parents and children to gather once more before Him and thank Him for the blessings of the day that is past. Do not be governed by circumstances. Family worship should not be governed by circumstances. You are not to pray occasionally, and when you have a large day's work to do, neglect it. In thus doing, you lead your children to look upon prayers of no special consequence. Prayer means very much to the children of God, and thank offerings should come up before God morning and evening. Says the psalmist, O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. Fathers and mothers, however pressing your business, do not fail to gather your family around God's altar. Ask for the guardianship of holy angels in your home. Remember that your dear ones are exposed to temptations. In our efforts for the comfort and happiness of guests, let us not overlook our obligations to God. The hour of prayer should not be neglected for any consideration. Do not talk and amuse yourselves till all are too weary to enjoy the season of devotion. To do this is to present to God a lame offering. At an early hour of the evening, when we can pray unhurriedly and understandingly, we should present our supplications and raise our voices in happy, grateful praise. Let all who visit Christians see that the hour of prayer is the most precious, the most sacred, and the happiest hour of the day. These seasons of devotion exert a refining, elevating influence upon all who participate in them. They bring a peace and rest grateful to the Spirit. Children to respect the worship hour. Your children should be educated to be kind, thoughtful of others, gentle, easy to be entreated, and above everything else, to respect religious things and feel the importance of the claims of God. They should be taught to respect the hour of prayer. They should be required to rise in the morning so as to be present at family worship. Make the worship period interesting. The father, who is the priest of his household, should conduct the morning and evening worship. There is no reason why this should not be the most interesting and enjoyable exercise of the home life, and God is dishonored when it is made dry and irksome. Let the seasons of family worship be short and spirited. Do not let your children or any member of your family dread them because of their tediousness or lack of interest. When a long chapter is read and explained and a long prayer offered, this precious service becomes wearisome, and it is a relief when it is over. It should be the special object of the heads of the family to make the hour of worship intensely interesting. By a little thought and careful preparation for this season, when we come into the presence of God, family worship can be made pleasant and will be fraught with results that eternity alone will reveal. Let the Father select a portion of Scripture that is interesting and easily understood. A few verses will be sufficient to furnish a lesson which may be studied and practiced through the day. Questions may be asked. A few earnest, interesting remarks made or incident short to the point may be brought in by way of illustration. At least a few verses of spirited song may be sung, and the prayer offered should be short and pointed. The one who leads in prayer should not pray about everything, but should express his needs in simple words and praise God with thanksgiving. In arousing and strengthening a love for Bible study, much depends on the use of the hour of worship. The hours of morning and evening worship should be the sweetest and most helpful of the day. 
let it be understood that into these hours no troubled, unkind thoughts are to intrude, that parents and children assemble to meet with Jesus and to invite into the home the presence of holy angels. Let the services be brief and full of life, adapted to the occasion and varied from time to time. Let all join in the Bible reading and learn and often repeat God's law. It will add to the interest of the children if they are sometimes permitted to select the reading. Question them upon it and let them ask questions. Mention anything that will serve to illustrate its meaning. When the service is not thus made too lengthy, let the little ones take part in prayer and let them join in song, if it be but a single verse. Pray clearly and distinctly. By your own example, teach your children to pray with clear, distinct voice. Teach them to lift their heads from the chair and never to cover their faces with their hands. Thus they can offer their simple prayers, repeating the Lord's Prayer in concert. The Power of Music The history of the songs of the Bible is full of suggestion as to the uses and benefits of music and song. Music is often perverted to serve purposes of evil, and it thus becomes one of the most alluring agencies of temptation. But rightly employed, it is a precious gift of God designed to uplift the thoughts to high and noble themes to inspire and elevate the soul. It is one of the most effective means of impressing the heart with spiritual truth. How often to the soul hard-pressed and ready to despair, memory recalls some word of God's, the long-forgotten burden of a childhood song, and temptations lose their power. Life takes on new meaning and new purpose, and courage and gladness are imparted to other souls. The value of song as a means of education should never be lost sight of. Let there be singing in the home of songs that are sweet and pure, and there will be fewer words of censure and more of cheerfulness and hope and joy. Let there be singing in the school, and the pupils will be drawn closer to God, to their teachers, and to one another. As a part of religious service, singing is as much an act of worship as is prayer. Indeed, many a song is prayer. If the child is taught to realize this, he will think more of the meaning of the words he sings and will be more susceptible to their power. Instrumental and vocal. Evening and morning, join with your children in God's worship, repeating his word and singing his praise. Teach them to repeat God's law. Concerning the commandments, the Israelites were instructed. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Accordingly, Moses directed the Israelites to set the words of the law to music. While the older children played on instruments, the younger ones marched, singing in concert the song of God's commandments. In later years, they retained in their minds the words of the law which they learned during childhood. If it was essential for Moses to embody the commandments in sacred song, so that as they marched in the wilderness, the children could learn to sing the law verse by verse, how essential it is at this time to teach our children God's word. Let us come up to the help of the Lord, instructing our children to keep the commandments to the letter. Let us do everything in our power to make music in our homes that God may come in. Special Worship Period for Sabbath at family worship, on Sabbath, let the children take part. Let all bring their Bibles and each read a verse or two. Then let some familiar hymn be sung, followed by prayer. For this Christ has given a model. The Lord's Prayer was not intended to be repeated merely as a form, but it is an illustration of what our prayer should be, simple, earnest, and comprehensive. In a single petition, tell the Lord your needs and express gratitude for His mercies. Thus you invite Jesus as a welcome guest into your home and heart. In the family, long prayers concerning remote objects are not in place. They make the hour of prayer weariness when it should be regarded as a privilege and blessing. Make the season one of interest and joy. More prayer means less punishment. We should pray to God more much than we do. There is great strength and blessing in praying together in our families with and for our children. When my children have done wrong and I have talked with them kindly and then prayed with them, I have never found it necessary after that to punish them. 
their hearts would melt in tenderness before the Holy Spirit that came in answer to prayer. Benefits of Solitary Prayer It was in hours of solitary prayer that Jesus, in his earth life, received wisdom and power. Let the youth follow his example in finding at dawn and twilight a quiet season for communion with their Father in heaven. And throughout the day let them lift up their hearts to God. At every step of our way, he says, I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand. Fear not, I will help thee. Isaiah 41, 13. Could our children learn these lessons in the morning of their years, what freshness and power, what joy and sweetness would be brought into their lives? The gates of heaven are open to every mother. When Christ bowed on the banks of Jordan, after his baptism and offered up prayer in behalf of humanity, the heavens were opened and the Spirit of God, like a dove of burnished gold, encircled the form of the Savior, and a voice from heaven which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. What significance does this have for you? It says that heaven is open to your prayers. It says that you are accepted in the beloved. The gates are open for every mother who would lay her burden at the Savior's feet. It says that Christ has encircled the race with his human arm, And with his divine arm he has grasped the throne of the infinite and united man with God and earth with heaven. The prayers of Christian mothers are not disregarded by the Father of all who sent his Son to the earth to ransom a people for himself. He will not turn away your petitions and leave you and yours to the buffeting of Satan in the great day of final conflict. It is for you to work with simplicity and faithfulness, and God will establish the work of your hands.